Um, so yeah, before we begin, Melissa, um, just tell us a bit about what you've written and what you're working on and stuff. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, so um, my story, the, uh, the clue about my story is actually my background picture here. Um, the fields of corn and wheat definitely play a big part in this. Um, I wanted to write something that was more um, folk horror. Um, it's a genre I really, really like. Um, and it was actually inspired by um, these creepy little corn dollies. I don't know whether you've ever seen them, um, where like ears of corn are kind of like dried and they're shaped into like figures of women and some of them are put into dresses and, and things like that. I just thought there was something just a little bit creepy um, <sighs> and a little bit uncanny um, about them. And then it just sort of went from there, really. Um, yeah, but other than that, um, I'm working on a sort of novella, uh, stroke short story, um, or at least I'm trying to, <laughs> to, to work on it um, around work and life and everything else. You know, that that's a bit more of a haunted house story. Um, and yeah, generally I do write stuff that's quite creepy and that, that's in the horror vein, um, really. Um, I think we were talking about humour a bit earlier. I don't really do funny in, in, in stories, so you're not going <laughs> to... I prefer prefer the darker side. You, in writing um, anyway, yeah. You wrote a piece for Horrified, which kind of captures what we're talking about tonight. It was about the, the darkness, the inherent darkness of the British countryside. Yeah. Oak horror is very much like that, isn't it? It's very much about what lies beneath, I think, and, and the history that's in the fields and in the buildings that we're in. And um, I'm really, really fascinated about that old houses and all the stories and, and the things that have happened, you know, throughout the generations. And I think it's the same with sort of fields and things. You could be walking through a beautiful field that might have once been a battlefield or there might have been some really horrible things that happened there once. Um, and I think there's also this sense as well with, with the countryside and the rural that more and more of us are getting a bit alienated from it. Um, and there's definitely a school of thought now that, you know, people are grown up, you know, living in cities or more suburban areas. And actually, when you go into these very rural places, you know, the quietness, the smells, the sounds, um, it's actually, you know, it, it's quite scary um, or it can be. So I, I like that tension. Um, I mean, I actually do love the countryside. I think it's, you know, I think it's very good, you know, for, for your mental well-being. But I think there is just that tension there. And I think that's what's interesting. Um, that tension between something on the surface that looks very pastoral and calming and, and, and peaceful versus this sort of darker undercurrent, really. So that's kind of a little bit of, of what I'm drawing on with, with this story. But it is also inspired, um, I suppose, by, by the more sort of obviously kind of folk horror uh, genre, really. So the Wicker Man and even things like uh, Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, um, just that sense of, yeah, having outsiders coming into a rural community and, and, and the differences. Yeah, um, just for, uh, I know my mum and dad don't watch folk horror. I don't know if anybody else knows a lot about it, but it, it's a lot of it's about urban versus rural and clashes of beliefs, mm. isn't it? Ancient yeah. versus modern um but sometimes it can be folk horror without even being supernatural um like the wicker man no no supernatural goings on in the wicker man at all it's just no it's good. almost like those those paganism those older belief systems coming into and i think um i mean there's if you're interested there's, there's lots of sort of good books i can put put some stuff in the chat um about it but you know, quite often there's a catalyst or, or, or something that's going to make people kind of return to those older ways uh, of thinking. You know, it can be driven by fear or, or, or changes. I mean, I hint at this a little bit in my story um, around with climate change um, and having heat waves and wildfires and, and, and things like that, um, which is definitely something I think we're probably all sort of concerned about. But yeah, folk horror is a little bit of an unusual term, really, isn't it? It doesn't sort of really mean much on its own. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'll um, I'll hand over to you. I'll turn myself off, and um, we'll look forward to hearing what you've got. To, uh, what story you've got to tell us? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. Right. Well, I'm going to dive right in. Um, so the story is called "This Thing of Straw." Even though a cornfield doesn't sleep. It dreams. 
Into night's breath go its whispers. Carried by the wind is its song, a discordant melody waiting to be heard. In days of scorching sun, it stands rigid. Under cool moonlight, it stretches, then it can breathe, inhaling and exhaling in a rhythm unseen and unheard, the lungs of the fields and the furrows. Charlotte first noticed a couple of kernels stuck to her skin as she dried herself after a shower. They looked like mummified baby teeth. Weird, but after all, she was staying on a farm and she spent most of the day wandering around cornfields taller than her. And there were other things to worry about, like getting through this August bank holiday weekend without murdering her sister, Amy, and her equally annoying new husband, Mark. It was amusing that Amy, who cried as a kid if mud got on her clothes, had married into a farming family. Not that her husband was much of a farmer. He'd left for uni the first chance he'd got, and now he worked for a bank in Canary Wolf. It was safe to say that both Amy and Mark were fully sterilised from rural life. Maybe that was why Amy had pleaded until Charlotte said she'd come to Mark's parents' farm, hidden away in a corner of Devon. This was how it always ended up. Amy, the youngest and cutest, got everything she wanted, while the big sister Charlie had to be the sensible one. Charlotte loved being outdoors, and when she wasn't travelling with the orchestra, she nurtured an immaculate green oasis in her small yard. You like plants and stuff, Charlie. You'll have something in common with them. It didn't matter when Charlotte tried to explain that having green fingers in a small garden wasn't quite the same as running a farm. As she opened the bedroom door, she heard murmurs of voices downstairs and the aromas of bacon, manure and hay drifted up. It was 6 a.m. She was an early riser, but clearly not as early as the Simons family. Trying not to creak too much coming down the worn wooden stairs, she nonetheless made the family seated at the dining table jolt and turn her way. Oh, it's you, Charlotte, said Mrs. Simons. Come and sit. You gave us a fright. We thought it was Mark and well, I doubt he's been up this early since he was in a nappy. Mark's brother, Tom, made a scoffing noise. Wouldn't know about a day's work before sunup if it slapped him in the face. The Simons family looked strangely similar, apart from Mark, but now she recognised the same long and bulging nose. She didn't know why, but she thought that they'd all be plumpish with rounded faces, rosy cheeks and tanned bodies. That Mrs. Simons would be bustling away with a floral apron, baking and cleaning. Stupid, obviously. But still, the leanness of the family surprised her. Just enough flesh and muscle to cover their skeletons. Pale skins that spoke of night toil rather than summer days. There was a narrowness and dullness to their eyes, despite their friendly smiles. A weariness hung over their heads and hunched shoulders, a pea soup had drowned in them. She didn't need any farming knowledge to know that here was a hard life, a relentless summer with burning heat and no rain for weeks. She'd seen the scorched patches from wildfires and the thinness of fields that she imagined were once densely packed. It made her uneasy almost at once, although Amy and Mark seemed oblivious at dinner last night. Another thing that had made her unsettled were all the homages to corn and wheat inside the house, in every room, even the bathrooms. Plats of wheat fashioned into the shape of women adorned the walls and the mantelpieces, staring at her wherever she went. Here on the dining table, as a centrepiece, was the largest figure blocking her view of Mr and Mrs Simons. This thing of straw wore a white smock. Sticking out of the sleeves were hands made of many fingers of dried wheat. Out of the neck rose a head full of ears of corn, strands sticking out in a ball. It looked nothing like a woman, of course, or even a doll, but there was enough of something real to give Charlotte pause and to feel that somewhere amongst that head of corn were eyes that watched, ears that heard, and a mouth that could speak if it wanted to. And when she dragged her gaze from it and tried to focus on her plate of eggs and bacon or Tom's knee bouncing up and down next to her, she could have sworn that head tilted in a silent question to her. By the time Amy and Mark appeared, they'd missed both breakfast and lunch. 
Mr. Simons and Tom were back out on the land somewhere, and Charlotte, with nothing else to do, had been walking in the fields again. The harvesting was in full swing, and corn and wheat that had survived the summer drought would be cut. Reapers filled the fields, men and women, young and old, hacking away. Swish, swish, swish. Down came the blades, down collapsed the corn. Charlotte felt a churning in her gut. The corn and the wheat had survived so much, growing so high, only to still get beheaded. Charlotte felt the same in her own garden. She knew she had to prune, but there was something horrible about cutting off a healthy green stem. It felt all wrong. Oh, Charlie, come back inside with me, Amy shouted from the edge of the garden, clearly not wanting to step into the fields. I can't bear this smell. Look at my eyes. It's all this pollen. I'm allergic. Amy's eyes did look bloodshot and the tip of her nose had been rubbed clean of makeup and shone red. As they walked back through the garden to the farmhouse, a pile of silver blades on long wooden handles were stacked against the kitchen wall, metal fangs on sticks. They glinted in the light, new, sharp and waiting. Charlotte rubbed her neck. A gust of wind blew her hair back, exposing the skin to the sweaty air. She couldn't help but think in the days of beheading, how easy a blade like that could cut through a neck as slender as hers. Holy hell, what are all these scythes doing here? said Mark from the doorway. Amy, babes, don't go near them, come back inside. Ah, you remember what they're for then, city boy, said Tom, who had emerged from a wooden shed next to the house. You're using scythes to cut the corn, it will take days. Now more lads from the village are coming. Tomorrow night will be done, and we could give thanks for this miserable harvest. Haven't you heard of a combine harvester? You'd be done in a few hours instead of having the whole village come up here. It's not cost effective. Dad always used to get one. We used to do a lot of things, but this is a third year of drought, three years of heat waves, wildfires, the red devil dancing through the fields. So yeah, things change. You'll see. Charlotte had to be the only person in the farmhouse not to sleep. But then again, that was not all that unusual. Just one hour, please, two hours. Any break from the incessant chatter in her head would be great. Her skin felt tight and itchy as she lay awake. She scratched at her legs, up and down her calves, white contrails appearing on her skin. Then she tried to rub her back up and down against the sheets never quite managing to reach the itch. It was always an inch or two away from her nails. With the window open and it was too hot to close it, Charlotte heard the cornfields. During the day, she hadn't noticed any sounds except for the constant shriek of birds and the hacking and swishing of blades. Now in the darkness, the cornfield sang. That was the only way to describe it. It had its own melody and rhythm, much like the rolling waves of the sea, or the rising hiss of leaves and branches in a wood. It was a sad song, a lament. The corn cried for all that it had lost, all that it dreamed to be, its halted journey into the skies to reach the sun. There were no tears it could shed, so instead in the earth the roots comforted each other, shrinking close, letting the soil deep down that was still damp, and the burying words and the worms and the beetles nurture it. Amongst the laments, a note of hope, it would rise again. Spring would come, and maybe by then, it would have forgotten these wounds. She wished she'd brought her cello with her. Maybe she could have captured their song and given some reply. But she knew that no human-made instrument could ever find these notes or chords. The sun piercing through the flimsy curtains woke her not long after dawn. She noticed a kernel stuck inside uh, of her elbow, stretching and sitting up, a fine coat of pale yellow seeds dusted her pillow. Pulling back the sheet, mummified tiny teeth were scattered across the bed. Her stomach churned and she grabbed the water bottle by her bedside and tried to gulp some down, but it came back up, something lodged in her throat. Coughing and retching, she managed to hack it up, a small ball of what looked like straw, and mingled in amongst the bile and the drool, little pieces of corn. As she showered, she realised that some of those kernels felt like they were glued to her skin. 
in the creases of her elbows, behind her knees, and digging into her belly button. She picked and scratched at them, but they didn't come off. She aimed the jet of the shower head at them, and still they stayed put. Only once she was dry and she forcefully rubbed a hard towel against her skin until it went pink and red, did they finally fall off. Sitting around the breakfast table, Amy and Mark making the effort to join in on their last day, it was as if two worlds existed. Amy babbled away, barely taking a pause for breath, seemingly not caring or wanting any response. Mark chuckled along with her at opportune moments. For Mr and Mrs Simons and Tom, it was a solemn occasion. For Charlotte too. And she felt that even the corn dolly in the centre of the table drooped forward a little. Already the notes from the corn song were fading from her mind, but the rhythm stayed with her. She wasn't sure if anyone else had heard the fields. As she tapped its beat against the tabletop, she watched, it, she watched the faces around her to see if there was any glimmer of recognition. There wasn't. The fields had been hacked away until they were naked and the muddy boots of villagers stomped about in the corn's graves, trampling any remaining tufts that had escaped the slice of the scythes. The reapers stood in a circle at the back of the field furthest from the farmhouse. Mr. Simon stood in the centre. Behind them in the next line stood Charlotte, Amy, Mark, Tom and Mrs. Simons. The rest of the villagers filled in around them. Earlier during the reaping, there had been rollicking and shouts and cans of beer glugged. Now everyone stood still in a silent prayer. As the impending night sucked away the remaining light, a gloom fell around them. They had hacked and chased the corn to the very edge of this last field. And now these couple of handfuls of straw like wheat were all that remained of acres of crop. Charlotte squeezed her eyes shut, willing her tears to go back inside her body. But of course, the only way they could disappear was to escape her eyelids and slide down her cheeks. She fought back the urge to run forward and lay her body down on top of the last of the wheat. Reapers, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Mr. Simons turned to address the gathering. It was the first time Charlotte had heard his voice properly. He always mumbled, but now his voice rang out as loud and clear as a preacher on Sunday. What have I, he said. What have he, answered the villagers, right away in a practice exchange. They knew what to say and when, just as in a church service. Here is her neck, said Mr. Simons. Her neck, her neck, came the answering cry from the villagers. What shall he do? Cut her off. Off, 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 the villagers shouted into the twilight, getting more excited with each shout. Charlotte looked to her side at Amy, and for the first time, Amy's expression matched the anxiety that she knew must be on her own face. All the reapers stepped forward and raised their scythes up high, heads tilted up to darkening skies, the shape of the full moon becoming brighter, the first stars glinting. Mr. Simon stepped forward into the circle while the villagers screamed, cut her, cut her, cut her, in a rallying cry. In one fluid move, down came the scythe, slicing with a force that belied the thinness of Mr. Simon's arms. He scooped up the sheaves of remaining straw and wheat and raised it above his head. I have her, I have her. Charlotte couldn't speak, her breath caught. Pain seared through her neck, her skin on fire. Her hands clutched at her throat. It was wet. When she lowered her hands, they were covered in blood. Unable to turn her head left or right, she kept staring straight ahead at Mr. Simons, waving the neck of corn. Beside her, she felt Amy move. Then her sister's screams pierced through the noise of the crowd making Mr. Simons turn their way. But Charlotte could no longer see anyone. Corn and straw was all she could see. Straw rubbed against her face, straw stuck out of her ears, straw, scratchy and dried, filled her mouth, her throat. There was nothing but straw.
Um, so, what can you tell us about you and your writings and things? Uh, my writings are haphazard. <laughs> they come and go. Um, I have been on a bit of a, I suppose, camping horror run recently, which is what's coming tonight. Um, I, you know, I figured there was a couple of people who might be doing fruity, fruity harvest stories and, and wanted to give us a little bit of variety. Um, so yeah, my story is, is set very much in the cold and dark of September, but um, focuses on the dangers of going camping, I suppose, and why you should always follow the rules. Yeah, in fact, the last story, and I don't know if it was the last thing you had published, was it the, um, the one where the campers get attacked by killer moths? It was the killer moths, yes. Um, <laughs> which is a big fear of mine. And yeah, any, anything freaky that can, can get you in the dark is a, a big no-no for me. And there has been a few of my stories have centered around that. Um, uh, so this is just a running theme for me now. And our, oh, our poster that Lydia did um, for us, the artwork, it was all rotting vegetables with a big old moth crawling over it. I know. <laughs> had to glance at it very quickly and go ah, and run away i know i've mentioned this to you in chat messages but you've got so many camping horror stories now you should have a um a, an anthology coming out called intense yeah this is tense will happen at some point um hopefully <laughs> <laughs> anyway i'm gonna get my act together um, I, I, so yeah um and um go for it yeah this story is is called the, bon the monster behind me because I couldn't think of a better title. Um, yeah, I still don't know what happened that night in September so many years ago. I can hear the rain again, but these days I also feel it in my bones. The cold seeps through my skin and my knees ache as I slip once more into memory shrouded in a nightmare. Why can't we just go to a nice B&B? I'd grumbled over coffee when Alison first suggested the trip to me. It'll be September, it'll be cold and it'll be wet. Come on, babe, we can have a nice cosy few nights in the lakes instead. She flicked her fingers at me as she walked over from washing the dishes, a smile on her face. She always looked like she was up to something secret and mischievous, which I suppose she was at this moment in time. But she knew it wore me down and made me agree to what she wanted to do. I secretly loved it, but I never told her that when I had the chance. Because, my love, the skies are clear currently and September is dark, perfect for seeing the stars in the countryside. We can have a little fire on this site, take some drinks, and a tent is cosy enough. You know what they say about the best ways to stay warm. I rolled my eyes before laughing. She'd won and she knew it. We kissed to seal the deal and I tasted orange juice. I still think of that morning when I drink it, of how different things would be if I'd insisted on staying somewhere else, somewhere indoors. As we slowly made our way down B roads a few weeks later, the autumn sun reflected off puddles, Hedges double the height of our car cloaked us in a cold shadow and the little light that we could see teased us of a warmth just gone. Alison had insisted on driving, reminding me I'd only get us lost, the city girl that I was. She had been to the campsite before with her friends, she said, and it wasn't far away. Easy to get to, but it would still feel like an escape after a busy week at work. The hedges started to shrivel and diminish around us as we came to a fork in the road. The open window let in the smell of the countryside, wet grass, hay, and even the undertone of manure that breathed an earthy smell into the air. I didn't hate it. I was excited even by this point. The car journey had been filled with songs we loved and talk of the week behind us, what Alison's boss was doing that week to annoy her, what my co-workers had gossiped about. The usual stuff was made more exciting because of the adventure we were on. I could see the field surrounding us now and the car was bathed in sunlight, warming my arms up as she put the indicators on and slowed to a crawl. I think, Alison said, leaning forward on the steering wheel and looking left. Think this is it? Yes. Ha, knew I'd get us here. I smiled wanly. Had every faith in you, my dear. She thumped the steering wheel in delight. The small pleasures always brought her joys like this. Did you know there's monsters in these here parts? Monsters? I sat up, looking at her sceptically. I'd play along. Mm-hmm. They say it's something like a Wendigo, but you know, British that it lives in the forest and will prey on anything that gets lost in the dark. And this campsite, well, just on the edge of the forest, you see. She pointed ahead to the welcome gate and the trees beyond. 
There was a sign off to the side of it warning campers to keep their dogs on their leads and another saying not to leave rubbish lying around. That sign, she said, pointing to the one about dogs, that only went up after someone's dog went missing a few years back. The look on her face was serious. She loved telling horror stories. Little Fido or Butch or whatever he was called wandered off one night, his owners thinking he'd be okay to sleep outside the tent. And then everyone heard a yelp, a pained howl, then silence. And he was never seen again. So now they say, keep dogs on leads or in sight at all times. I nodded knowingly, solemnly, as if this was the gravest matter to hand. Ah, I see. Well, when we're settled, you'll have to tell me why we can't leave rubbish lying around. What beast that attracts? I couldn't keep a straight face. I looked across at her. Neither could she. Fits of laughter took over us as we found a quiet space at the back of the site and started to set up for the day ahead. We decided to go closer to the trees than not, in the hope it would give a little bit of shelter from the wind if it picked up in the night. The trees were so dense here, and by the time we had pitched our tent, shadow had enshrouded us once again, the height of the trees blocking out a low autumn sun. The campsite didn't get much busier that day. We didn't expect it to really, but we were still glad it didn't. There was a group, two older couples who camped closest to us, but still kept their distance out of politeness. No need to be on top of each other when it was empty. We waved at them when we arrived, passing the time of day when they asked if they were okay to camp where they were. The kids had all just gone to uni, so they were distracting themselves while enjoying the freedom you feel after 18 years of parenthood. We laughed like we understood, despite only being free from parents for a few years ourselves. But they were nice enough and offered us a bottle of wine. We offered them some beers in return and went our separate ways. Campsites were like that at this time of the year. Alison said as we added the wine to our cooler, everyone makes friends, wants to know what you're escaping from, even if it's nothing. I didn't like marshmallows, so they were never suggested when we went away. Alice and I had both briefly been in scouts and had found a campfire treat there we enjoyed. So, Alison started, as she stated, as she started peeling bananas. You can't leave rubbish lying around. You have to collect it all. Not just for the obvious reasons, you know, the environment, being kind to site owners, but because of the beast, it helps it find you. I handed the open bag of chocolate buttons, raising my eyebrows as she laid the bananas on pieces of tinfoil. They can smell like a dog. Are you sure you're not just thinking of badgers or raccoons? She started pushing chocolate buttons into the bananas at centimeter intervals before wrapping them in foil and putting them on the fire. Aha, no, but that's how they get away with it. People think it's only raccoons, foxes, the likes that sniff out your rubbish. But when this beast, this tall, threatening thing that lurks in the woods, gets a whiff of it, well, it can find where the campsites are, where the people are, and it knows it has a feast. She cackled with glee. I don't think she believed it herself, really, but she still glanced over her shoulder, looking at the trees before she got the tongs and pulled the bananas off the fire. We smiled at each other. The campsite was peaceful, and this was our favourite part. With pinched fingers, we unwrapped the foil and the smell, that warm chocolatey smell filled the air. I bit into mine, relishing in the strange sensation of toasted bananas, never going crispy like other campfire foods, but holding the heat and mixed with the chocolate, it tasted like a winter pudding, warming you up from the inside. It was a special kind of nostalgia we experienced, thinking of when we'd first met, climbing trees and learning to tie knots for our friends, embracing our differences and being embraced by everyone close to us. We hadn't expected it to be so easy. Once upon a time, we were lucky. Don't forget to collect all the rubbish, Alison shouted over her shoulder as she went off to the guest house, going to the toilet one last time before we went to bed. I could hear another group of campers shout something and laugh as she walked past, a group of college kids who camped closest to the toilets, probably the most unsure of camping here and wanting to be close to the hum of civilization. I smiled to myself, collecting all the rubbish and tying it in a bag before getting into the tent. I didn't want the smell of banana peel to fill the tent though, so I left the bag outside, but it was tied. And Alison would bring it in if it was a big deal, I thought to myself as I shuffled into the sleeping bag. She was back minutes later, but not with the bag. So I assumed it was okay and didn't mention it. Now I think about it, it was dark and maybe she just didn't see it. The hammering of the rain against the vinyl of the tent woke me up hours later. Alison said it helped her sleep, but for me, it did the opposite keeping me awake and making me need to pee. The rain would have put out the fire by now, I thought to myself, and the darkness would be thick, pushed in further by the trees surrounding us. Besides all that, the guest house wasn't exactly in a straight line from our tent, and I didn't like the idea of getting lost in the dark. Alison, 
Alison, I need to pee, get up. I nudged her sleeping body, but she responded only with a dismissive grunt and shoving the torch against my leg. I sighed. I couldn't blame her. It was my own fault for not going when she went. But I still begrudged the thought of going out alone, especially after all the scary she th stories she told me about hide behinds and wendigos and all the other forest folk. She had always loved to scare me. It didn't affect her in the same way. She thought it was all hooey. And if I'd never left the tent, maybe I'd feel the same. Okay, fine, I mumbled, pulling on a coat over my pajamas. Send the search party if I'm not back in 15, I guess. This time the grunt was one of approval. A mumbled beware of the monsters and then heavy rhythmic breathing filled the air again. I looked over my shoulder at the sleeping form of my beloved Alison, hair tousled across her face and a smile teasing the corners of her lips. These days that's how I try to remember, almost peaceful, almost happy. I checked the torch before I left the tent. The light flickered briefly but stayed on. Good enough for me, I thought, as I braced myself for outside. But the downpour never hit me. While inside the tent, it sounded like one of the worst storms I'd ever heard. Outside, however, the air was warm, humid almost, and a fine mist landed on my outstretched arm. Maybe I'm still tired, I thought, shrugging my shoulders, but leaving the coat on just in case it was a temporary lull. I clicked the torch back on once I'd resealed the tent, balancing it between my knees so I could loosely fasten my shoes. I wish looking back that I'd lingered longer here, checking our surroundings, making sure that our tent was still safe, but I didn't. I was so scared the rain would start again, I set off sharply to avoid the downpour. If I'd looked back, maybe it wouldn't have come for us. Maybe the light would have scared it off in time. Silence covered the campsite. Burning embers of fires long past dotted the ground, providing a compass pointing towards the guest house. I pointed the torch down, looking for anything that might trip me up, focusing on my feet. That was the first time I heard it. It was the cracking of a branch underfoot, but not under mine. It was a heavy, hungry breathing coming from behind me. I hadn't even reached the next tent yet. I didn't think it would be the college kids playing tricks. They were probably in that deep sleep which beer provides. No, this was animal. This was hunting. I turned around, shining my torch upwards towards the trees that enclosed us. Was there something there behind the tree that stood by our tent? No, you'd see it, I reasoned with myself. Nothing could sneak up that easily staying so hidden, not here. Hide behinds maybe, but they weren't real. Another branch snapped, still behind me, even though I turned my back towards the tent. I disregarded the fort. The noise made more sense coming from where the other tents were. I turned back towards them, towards the guest house. Alison is asleep, I thought. She'll be fine in the tent. I could see the two tents belonging to the group of parents, one bright orange and the other a darker model, forest green, a tent for those who are in the woods hunting a lot. I knew that just after them was the teenagers and then the guest house. So my direction was correct. The noises hadn't got me turned around, despite how dizzy I felt. But it was so silent, still, that I could swear I could hear that heavy, hungry breathing stalking me. My brain tried to reason with me. These old folks sleep heavy. Probably just them. I shrugged, shivering down my spine, picking up the pace. Sarah? I heard the voice behind me. My blood ran cold. Footsteps, too many footsteps. Something was following Alison behind me. Ali, I said in as level of a tone as I could muster. Go back to the tent, I'm fine. Go back, please. She stopped. The other footsteps didn't. Is someone playing a joke on us? Who's behind me? I heard Alison snap and her feet swivel across damp grass. If I hadn't turned around mere seconds behind her, maybe she'd still be here. Maybe it would have taken me. Instead, it stood between us, facing Alison's back, fur so dense that the beam from my torch seemed to get lost in it. Oh God, I whispered. Alison's scream was cut short as that thing, that tall, impossibly skinny thing covered in fur enveloped her. It was no longer branches that I could hear cracking. I ran towards them as I felt li warm liquid hit my shins. I didn't look, I couldn't look. It turned towards me, still holding her. And that's the image I tried to block from my mind. Alison's blonde hair turned crimson with blood and one eye gone, inexplicable even now as if sucked from the socket. The other eye stared lifelessly at me, yet filled with a, feel, a fear that would follow her soul to damnation. As it slowly backed away from my gaze, stepping past my tent and into the trees behind, it dropped Alison's body, its breathing guttural, now it was satiated. 
I couldn't look away, and from beneath that oblivion fur, where I expected to see a face, there was just a skull. The moonlight and my torch bounced off the bone. I could see a nose, a crack in its cheek, and something else. A single blood-soaked eye glistened in one of its sockets. I crumpled to the grass. As the thing faded into blackness, the rain suddenly got heavier and heavier. The downpour had returned. The unzipping of a tent behind me echoed in my ears before a scream filled the air and footsteps, finally normal footsteps, hurried towards my back. I can still hear the sirens, the shouting of the officers as they came over and saw the massacre at my feet. It took them hours to get me away, to calm me down and make sense of what I was saying. They thought the shock had made me delusional that I'd replaced what really happened with something fantastical, as if that would make it easier for my brain to process than the truth. I've heard now there are signs at the camp saying, beware of bears, but I never once said that was what I saw. Wow, Andrew's changed. <laughs> I thought I'd dress for the occasion. Looking good, is that roses? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what it is. It's, it's Hannah's, but I thought a flower crown uh, would be would be apposite. Uh, I'll just read out some of the thanks from the chat just for Libby's story first. Uh, let's see. Um, a couple of people like the chocolate and banana idea. I mentioned in the comments that we used to do that on scout camp, sticking bits of chocolate into a banana and then bunging it on the fire. Really nice. It was no longer the branches I could hear cracking. Nice. We've got an arg and an oo. Excellent atmosphere from Stuart there. Uh, Lydia likes mountain and camping horror stories. So you might say that they're like survival horror almost, maybe, I don't know. More love for the bananas. Uh, Melissa knew there was a reason she didn't ever want to go camping. Kirsty said uh, the yucky details were excellent. Alex liked the idea, he thought it was a great one. Um, and yeah, Andrew's right. We mentioned Libby's moth story before. It's it's nightmare fuel. It's it's just horrible. It's like the worst part of silence that I'm amplified. Um. Anyway, right. Back to you, Andrew. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Am I coming through? Okay. Yes. Yes, we can hear. You. That's fine. Real, because I could just I can't see myself when I'm talking, but that doesn't matter. I don't need to see myself. Okay. So um yeah I mean you and I have had a, a few stories published in things together um, and yeah. you've had a few separate as well but your big news apart from your big news from last week congratulations by the way thank you <laughs> uh, is this bad boy oh thank you very much <laughs> Andrew's book which you can get now on Amazon as an ebook or a paper book um which has got lots of great stories in I just thought I'd give that a, a plug for you thank you um, but your story tonight, um, completely new for tonight, isn't it? Brand new, brand spanking new. It's the newest, uh, it's, it's the last thing I've written. Uh, it's my first crack at folk horror for, for this evening. So I thought I'd just go com completely trad. Uh, everything that you would expect from a folk horror, silly folk going to the country, old ways, trouble. Yeah. and. After we've done this, we'll take a break for a snack break, toilet break, drink break, whatever. Although you may not want to eat or drink after you've heard this. Because <laughs> I've, I've read an early version of this. We were all sharing each other's work with each other just to check them over. And uh, yeah, it's, it's nasty <laughs> in the best possible way. Good. Um, Thank you. But yeah, if, if anybody wants to go and get a drink now, this would be the time to go and get yourself a pear cider. Yeah, I'm drinking some pear cider. Yeah, me too. I've got another bottle in the fridge as well, so although I might not want that one afterwards. <laughs> anyway, um, I shall hand over to your good self. Thank you very much. I will just uh, a crack on. It is a story called By Their Fruit, Will You Recognise Them? Even Evie had to admit that the pear cider was delicious. Perry, Nathan said, as he sipped his half pint. Cider made from pears is called Perry. She hated it when he corrected her, so Evie ignored him and took another sip from her own small glass. A sample the landlord had insisted she try, even though she was driving. It was a local specialty, apparently. It was sweet without being sickly and conjured memories of the pear drops her nan used to buy her. It would be a dangerous drink on a hot summer's day. A pint or two would go down quickly without tasting at all boozy. 
but it was autumn and she wasn't in a drinking mood, despite Nathan's best efforts to turn their camping trip around Herefordshire into a fortnight long real ale tasting session. They'd stopped off in Dean. It was only a small village, barely a dot on the satnav, but Nathan was getting hungry and wanted to grab a packet of crisps from a local shop as they made their way to the next campsite. As soon as he'd spotted the pub though, he suggested popping inside to see if they did food. The place was called the Quernstone and it was empty, save for the landlord, who told them that they only had crisps. That was half an hour ago. I think I'll have another, Nathan said, and drained his glass. What's it called? The pump doesn't have a label. The landlord sniffed and reached for another glass. I suppose it doesn't really have a name, he said, as he pulled the pump. We just call it the local tipple. A pint of tipple's all it's ever been called since I was a nipper. The pears come from a local orchard, family place, been there since the doomsday book. They brew it themselves and it only goes to the local villages. He placed the drink on the bar. What you really want to try is their syrup. Syrup, Nathan said. That's the real drink they make up there. Only a handful of barrels a year, not for sale. There'll be another batch from the autumn harvest. They invite everyone from the village up for a glass every October. What is it? I couldn't rightly say. It's not quite a liqueur, not really a mead. He nodded at Nathan's drink and said, if that's the honey, then this stuff is the royal jelly. If you're a man who appreciates an artisanal drink, then you shouldn't pass through without stopping off at the orchard. You'll not taste anything like it. There'll be a glass there for visitors. You can tell them Pete Matlock at the Quern sent you. Nathan turned to Evie with large eyes and she resigned herself to a detour. The satnav didn't recognise the farm, but the landlord's directions proved good enough. Evie pulled up on a gravel drive outside the farmhouse, but couldn't see any activity. The farm sat in a small dip in the land, a shallow green bowl which was crisscrossed with rows of trees. She could smell the faint tang of fruit on the crisp afternoon breeze as she stepped out of the car. Nathan stretched as he got out and pointed to what looked like a large silo in the distance. I wonder if that's where they brew the stuff, he said. At that moment, the front door to the farmhouse opened and a ruddy man in his 60s approached the archetype of a farmer in green wellies, brown corduroy trousers and a thick knitted jumper. Afternoon, he said curtly. Are you lost? No, Nathan said. We were just at the Quernstone in Dean. The farmer laughed gruffly before he could say any more. Oh, Pete's been waxing lyrical about our produce again, has he? Evie saw movement inside the house, someone hovering in the dark hallway watching them. The perry was exquisite, Nathan said, and Evie couldn't help but roll her eyes. He was being a suck up and it riled her unexpectedly. She wanted to be on her way to the campsite and didn't want to spend the afternoon listening to her boyfriend fanboying about cider. The landlord said that you made another drink, she said, to get the conversation moving along, and that you might let us have a sample. Nathan shot her a look, but she suspected that this busy man would appreciate bluntness more than flattery. The nectar, he said. Well, yes, it's true. We mark each harvest with a modest for sale and the people of Dean, Turton and Lickgate are invited to partake, but it's not something we hand out to all and sundry. Nathan's disappointment was palpable. Evie knew he would accept this knock back with a resigned shrug and they could be on their way, but the way he never stood up for himself needled her and she found herself wishing that he'd push back occasionally. Ah, oh, that is a shame, she said. We've come all the way from London. It's our wedding anniversary, she lied. We wanted to see a bit of our own country rather than sit on a foreign beach for a fortnight. And well, today is our actual anniversary. When Pete told us about the nectar back at the Quern, it sounded like the perfect way to celebrate the day. The farmer cleared his throat and glanced at her naked ring finger. She held his gaze stubbornly. Come on, pap, a voice called from the house, have a heart. A buxom woman in her early thirties was leaning against the door frame in a checked shirt and tight blue jeans. My daughter Ruth, the farmer said as she sauntered over, her sturdy boots crunching the gravel and her generous hips swaying. Evie knew Nathan's eyes were bugging out of their sockets without even looking and she instantly regretted arguing the toss on his behalf. They've come all this way, Ruth said as she joined them. The least we can do is give them a tour of the place and a little sip of nectar. I'll tell you what, her father said, take a couple of baskets with you and they can pay their way with an hour's picking. He turned to the couple brusquely and explained, 
Seasonal workers are like hen's teeth since fucking Brexit. And without waiting to see if they agreed to his terms, he turned and crunched his way back into the farmhouse and left them to his daughter. They clambered into a rattling old Land Rover and Ruth drove them up to the fields. It was a bumpy ride and Ruth explained that the farm was normally buzzing with activity at this time of year. We're lucky, she shouted over the chugging engine. We're fairly self-sufficient here, but the influx of workers was always welcome at come harvest time. The handbrake creaked as she parked and Evie clambered out. The air up here was heavy with the aroma of pears and a light October wind rustled the green and russet leaves as if a shiver of anticipation was passing through the branches. Ruth lifted a couple of wicker baskets from the back of the vehicle and passed them to Evie and Nathan. Then she walked them into the rows. The trees weren't particularly tall, maybe 15 feet high, but they were gnarled and reminded Evie of the illustrations in a book of fairy tales she'd had as a little girl. Most were heavy with knobbly green and yellow pears. We picked them before they're ripe, Ruth said. She plucked a pear with a dull snap and dropped it into Nathan's basket. They're left to ripen indoors. The trees look old, Nathan said, like he knew anything about pear trees. Some of these are 200 years old, Ruth said. We have an ancient rootstock here and we graft newer scions onto them to promote a good crop. Come, I'll show you. She swung away from the tree and led them deeper into the rows, hips swaying like a church bell. She looked like a pear herself from behind, and Evie noticed Nathan eyeing her backside more than once. She tried to ignore it, but she began to suspect that the woman was playing up to his immature attention. And more than that, she thought Ruth was gently mocking her as she did so. See here, Ruth said, grabbing a branch which seemed to be bandaged up. The lower part, close to the rough trunk, was worn and dark, but above the tape it seemed supple and green. Evie noticed the same thing on most of the trees around them. This upper part is called the scion, Ruth said, chosen for its leaves and fruits. It's grafted to the existing rootstock. Both tissues must be kept alive until the graft is taken. The scion is chosen because it contains the genes we want to duplicate. As long as the veins join, then the roots will feed the new branch and the branch will produce new fruit. I didn't realize it was so fiddly, Evie said. I thought you planted apple trees and got apples. Nature is durable and adaptable, said Ruth, and changeable with the right nudges. There was that mocking twinkle again. Well, sodder, he thought. Taking a piss out of city folk was probably as good as entertainment got around here. If you're of a mind, Ruth continued, it's a relatively simple matter to grow different types of pears or even different species of fruit altogether from the same tree. A fruit pick and mix, Nathan said, and Ruth laughed, even though the joke was lame. Would you like to see the fruit press? Ruth asked. Oh, it's getting, it's the sooner we can be on our way. I'd like to see it, Nathan said, and if he wanted to kick him in the shin. Lovely, Ruth said. If you hop back in the car, Nathan, I'll scoot us over to the processing shed while... I'm sorry, love, I've forgotten your name. Evie, she said through gritted teeth. Evie, Ruth echoed. Adam and Evie. You know, there are some who think the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden was a pear. Evie looked at her blankly. What the actual fuck was she wittering on about? Well, Ruth continued... We'll let Evie get a head start on the picking, and before you both go, I'll arrange a glass of pear nectar for you both to celebrate your special day. Evie watched the Land Rover clatter away across uneven ground. Fucking bumpkin, she thought, then instantly regretted it. She wasn't angry at that woman, or even Nathan, so much as herself. She was annoyed that his ogling had gotten under her skin. She checked out Hot Guys herself, of course she did, but it was the way he was so obvious about it which pissed her off. You're being a crab apple, she thought glumly. That was what her nan used to call her when she'd been a sulky teenager. She decided to make amends by doing her fair share of picking and plucked a couple of firm pears from the tree she was standing beneath. The branches bowed a little, as if they were trying to hold on to their fruit before the stalks snapped and sent them springing back. Give them up, she said like a movie villain. All your babies are destined for the press. She meandered through the orchard and plucked the occasional fruit as they caught her eye. The hum of her frustrated thoughts eventually dimmed and she became more aware of her surroundings, almost surprised to find herself alone and surrounded by pear trees and gently rolling hills. 
It seemed momentarily unreal compared to the city environment she'd been used to all her life. The breeze picked up again and sent a shiver through her, which was thrilling more than chilling. She took a deep breath and smelt woody trees, the tang of the pears, rich grass and dark soil. A lazy insect buzzed past, air moved through the branches, the chattering birds warbled on the wheezy and the wheezy chunter of a distant diesel engine. Maybe this was that mindfulness she'd heard about. She saw now that there were a few other pickers dotted through the orchard, remote figures moving amongst the trees with baskets of their own. Here, in this unexpected moment of peace, she imagined Ruth enduring one of Nathan's quick knee tremblers in an outbuilding somewhere and she sniggered. You'd never have the spine to do something so risky. Then she idly wondered if she might bump into a rugged farmhand who could take her from behind among the hay bales. Perhaps it would do their relationship some good, she thought ruefully, and reached for a fat pear, which disintegrated to mulch in her hand. She snatched her arm back with a noise of disgust and wiped the slimy brown chunks of rotten pear flesh on the grass. The tree looked sick. The leaves were covered in dark spots and the pears were swollen and sullen and they glistened with a sickly sweat. Evie sniffed her hand and wiped it again on a fresh patch of grass. Sod this country shit, she thought. She drifted closer to the silo Nathan had spotted when they'd arrived and she spied an open door set in its curved aluminium walls. Maybe there was someone inside who could take her back to the farmhouse. She suddenly wanted to be rid of this basket. She wanted to be back in her car and driving away from here. She marched towards it. It was gloomy inside the cylindrical building. Evie hovered in the doorway and called inside. Her voice echoed, but there was no answer. Lining the walls inside were dozens upon dozens of baskets full of pears, piled high and close to toppling. She entered, intending to drop her half full basket amongst the others. It was warm in there and a strange sweet smell rolled over her. There was also a dull drone which she couldn't instantly identify. She placed her basket on the floor in front of a precarious pile and realised that the smell was rolling off the mounds of fruit. Her eyes were getting accustomed to the dim light and with a wrinkle of her nose she saw that the crop here had been left to decompose into itself. Further inside the air was heavy with the smell of rot and the source of that low drone became clear. The fruit was covered in flies. Her arrival disturbed them and they burst around her in a brief flurry of annoyance before settling back into their putrefying feast. Why would they leave their crop to rot like this, Evie wondered. The sudden warmth and smell of spoiled fruit made her momentarily lightheaded. She was about to leave when something deeper inside the structure caught her eyes. The high roof was just a large grill which allowed slats of sombre autumn light to slant inside, only visible now that she'd spent some moments in the shadowy interior. Those grey fingers of light didn't brighten the place, but somehow made it seem gloomier as they hit the upper branches of a squat, thick tree which sat in the centre of the circular space. It was fatter than the trees outside. A chain of five, five people might circle it at arm's length, but it was not much taller. It was misshapen and the branches were twisted. Now Evie saw that there were paler shapes on the ground, propped up against the base of the fat trunk and lying between varicose roots. She took a step forward, then thought better of it. Behind her, the flies exploded into another angry cloud, disturbed again, and just as she realised that those paler shapes were naked bodies, an arm circled her chest from behind, and something cold and chemical smelling was pressing into her face, muffling her scream. She kicked and thrashed, but those arms held her fast. Very quickly, her own arms and legs became heavy, and she started to slump. That gagging anaesthetic clogged the back of her throat, and her head began to droop. Those thin beams of light dimmed, the crooked tree was swallowed by shadows, and she swiftly followed. Waking was a slow process. Thoughts passed Evie by like paper boats on a dark river. She grabbed for them occasionally, focused enough for a second or two to wonder where she was. She opened her eyes briefly. There were shapes around her, shadowy blobs. They were people. Her throat was rough and she was desperately thirsty. She tried to lick her lips. Everything went woozy again and the world slipped out of focus for a while. Over hours, maybe days, she came alive by degrees. She heard sounds, perhaps voices. Someone gently pressed a wet flannel to her forehead and temples. The cold of it sharpened her concentration for a moment and she opened her eyes. Ruth was tending to her in the gloom with a cold compress. There were others a short distance away who she couldn't see clearly. They were standing in a circle and maybe they were chanting, but she couldn't make out what they were saying. Ruth's fingers were at her lips 
and after a fussy moment, she felt a couple of ice chips being pushed into her mouth. Evie sucked on them gratefully, and her head swam again briefly while she concentrated on the cool relief. She gradually became aware that she was still in the shadowy silo, or back there. Had she been somewhere else for a while? She was propped up against the tree somehow, but whenever she tried to twist or move, she didn't have the strength. She was amongst the pale bodies she'd seen before, before she'd been attacked. That memory sent a surge of panic through her and the adrenaline roused her a little more. She felt sick and thirsty at the same time and the air was treacly with the smell of mouldering pears. Her lower back ached ferociously and she tried to shift again, again to ease the throbbing but found that she still couldn't move. She tried to speak but only managed a weak croak which caught someone's attention. They were at her side now with a beaker of water, one of those sippy cups that children used to avoid spills. She drank hungrily and the world around her became a little less foggy. She looked down at herself. They had strapped her to the tree. She was held upright with her back to it. Thick bindings circled her and the trunk, holding her in place. Her arms were pulled back, pressed against the rough bark. She could turn her head just enough to see a cannula taped into the crook of her elbow. She was connected to a tube which rose to a plump bag of yellowish liquid hanging from one of the lower branches. At first, her cries of protest were nothing but guttural grunts, but the more she came to, the clearer she was able to express herself. She strained against the binding, and at this, three or four people pattered barefoot across the dirt floor and held her steady. Calm now, one of them entreated. Fuck you, she slurred. Get me down. Calm now, a gruffer voice instructed, or we'll have your tongue. What are you doing? she demanded, then pleaded, but none of them spoke again. She bucked and howled, but those strong, patient hands held her in place until the strength seeped from her, and she was eventually still. It's a good graft, one of the women said, like a mother trying to send a baby to sleep. Let the rootstock feed you. New life, new issue, someone else murmured, and then other voices in the shadows echoed the words as if they were in church. Evie let her head drop, and now she got a good look at those pale bodies around her that she'd only glimpsed before. They were naked and bloated. Their bellies were distended, and flies walked over their faces, gathering at their eyes to sip the moisture there. But these people weren't simply lying amongst the roots. With a turn of her stomach, Evie saw that they were somehow joined. Flesh and bark were fused at elbow creases, armpits, groin and knee. A thick amber sap oozed from the trunk and hardened at those points where these bodies had been bonded with it. As she retched dryly, Evie noticed that the women's breasts were swollen and the men were engorged. Someone shuffled forwards through the gloom, a figure approaching on his knees. Evie began to sob when she saw that it was Nathan. The silence which hung between them was painful. He could barely look her in the eye. Eventually he said, if you tried the nectar, you'd understand. Then he bowed his head reverently to the breast of the woman nearest him. Her enlarged nipples were expressing a sticky liquid which glistened even in the limited light of this place. Nathan placed his lips over one like a suckling child and Evie began to scream. Others approached the tree and began to milk both male and female forms alike, collecting the viscid nectar in jars. Ruth was among them. She was kneeling between the knees of one of the prone women, gently massaging her round belly like a midwife until the waters broke, splashing the dirt floor and filling the air with the tang of pears and blood. Sallow thighs quivered, and Ruth began gathering the strange fruit in a wicker basket as it was expelled. She raised her eyes to Evie and said, Our true harvest. You tried some in Dean, I believe. Evie flailed her head and began smacking it against the tree. Ruth rose and signalled for one of the other farmhands to bring a jar of nectar. She brought it to Evie, who continued to writhe and bite and swear. Ruth did her best to calm her, but Evie's rage only grew, spitting almost incoherent obscenities when Ruth laid a hand on her cheek. You should calm yourself, Ruth said pointedly, lest you undo the graft. Fuck the graft, Evie hissed. Get me down from this fucking tree. The rootstock feeds you now, child, Ruth said plainly. It keeps you alive. What are you talking about? 
We removed your kidneys and your liver. You have no need for them anymore. We let you keep your head as a courtesy, but that can be remedied. There is no you separate from the rootstock now. She raised the jar of nectar to Evie's lips. Better to drink now. It quickens the healing. Evie was crying now. Her head was spinning and all around her were the soft, wet sounds of farmhands milking the ripe bodies for nectar. Drink, Ruth said, and the lip of the jar clinked against her teeth. The smell which rose from the jar was heavenly. Evie's tears were hot on her cheeks. She thought they felt slick and sticky, like sap. Cheers. So um, I'll, I'll hand over to, to Icy for, for her bit. Welcome. Hello. Hello. I don't know why I always feel the need to wave. I'm like a five year old going to see a train no, and I get on Zoom. Um, <laughs> that, you know, the famous parish council meeting. That would have been very different if I'd been on it. Um, <laughs> me being <laughs> me, because I like to be different. I've actually got two shorter stories um, to read, but they'll, they'll end up being the same length as everyone else's. Um, and the second one, I actually wrote it like during like the first, like lockdown one. Um, so it's kind of got a bit of like pandemic reference in it. Um, although it's not about COVID, it just that happens to be the scenario. So I just wanted to sort of um, set that scene in case anyone sort of forgets that there's a pandemic. Because um, I know quite a few people have. Um, but yeah, for anyone who doesn't know me already, um, I'm this like Geordie Chatterbox. Um and I I primarily write well, my short stories generally end up being ghost stories, um, but my novels end up being dark fantasy because I like to make life difficult for myself when I'm doing marketing. Um but a lot of what I do is kind of inspired by uh both horror films and folklore. Um so I'm gonna start off with this house. Oh, this story rather I'm saying house because I'm looking at my phone and that's where it has the name of the story and it's called the grey stone house um, and I actually wrote this one by hand um, to start with so like keeping it old school okay and this, I'll, one, this I'll is where the accent will come out right the grey stone house had been called that for as long as anyone in the village could remember but no one could remember anyone called grey stone ever actually living there and it wasn't like the building looked like it was made of grey stone. No, it was those red bricks that changed between dusky pink and pale brown as the light changes. All anyone could say for certain is that no one lasted there longer than six months. Midsummer's Eve was a popular day for families to flee, packing their kids and their most valued stuff into the car and heading for the motorway, never to return. Personally, I couldn't see what the problem was. I worked for a local company that was always called in to do a house clearance after every occupant abandoned the property. We cleared it and either sent the contents onto a new address or sold it all at auction for the owner who wanted a clean break with the place. Either way, the company made a pretty penny in fees, so the grey stone house ended up being quite lucrative for us. And I won't lie, the house badly needed an update. The wallpaper hadn't been in fashion since 1973 and the kitchen was the finest design the late 1980s had to offer. A few newer touches could be found here and there, but nothing substantial. No one ever stayed long enough. I'd been inside four times up until that point. Had I noticed anything strange that could explain the high turnover occupants? Not really. Yep, there was a funky smell in the back bedroom that overlooked the graveyard, which might have been damp. Sometimes, if you spent too long in the living room on your own, you felt like you were being watched. But the house had a reputation. Of course your mind ran away with you if you let it. At least, that was what I assumed was going on, right up until the last time that I went in there. It was a cold November morning. The latest family fled on Halloween, like they desperately wanted to be a cliché. The decorations still hung throughout the house, from fake cobwebs around the mirrors and black and orange tinsel wrapped around the banister. Cut out of witches on their broomsticks and paper ghosts fluttered in the draught from the open front door. Mick and Dave had already claimed the downstairs and were packing lamps and books into boxes. That meant Rich and I had to do the upstairs and poor Jason had gotten stuck with the loft. I carried the empty boxes upstairs. Rich had made a start on the smallest room, too small to be a proper bedroom, but big enough for a home office. 
Well, if you didn't mind a puffy cream wallpaper as your Zoom background. Rich gestured at the back bedroom. You do that one, mate, and we'll do the big room together, he said. Oh, but that room stinks, I replied. Rich rolled his eyes. So open the window then. He turned back to the bookshelves. I left him some flattened boxes by the door and went into the back bedroom. The door had an annoying tendency to swing closed, so I shoved a folded up beer mat under it to wedge it open against the carpet. I pushed open the window, thankful none of the owners had gotten around to fit in double glazing that might have needed a key. And the window didn't open easily, sticking about halfway, but it was nothing some WD-40 wouldn't fix. As always, the room set my teeth on edge. And it's entirely possible that I hated it so much purely because it faced the graveyard. Because that's just a bit weird, isn't it? But I tried hard to forget it was there, usually keeping my back to the window if I could. So I tried to convince myself the decor was the problem. And how could it not be? The nylon carpet could make you dizzy with its hectic yellow and brown pattern. And the wallpaper was totally on the wrong side of chintz. Whoever slept in here hadn't had much stuff though, so I congratulated myself that it wouldn't take that long to pack it all up. The smell started once I finished packing the first box. It was hard to describe, but the closest I could get was saying it was part wet dog, part old mould and part rotten vegetation. I looked around the room to see where it was coming from. And that's when I realised both the window and the door were now closed. I swore. Maybe Richard opened a window and the through draft had sucked the door shut. Either way, it made the smell stronger, so I just shoved open the window again. This time, I didn't rely on it just staying open, and I used the rusty metal bar on the furthest peg to keep the window propped open. I managed to avoid looking at the graveyard the whole time, keeping my gaze fixed on the window. I crossed the room and tried to open the door. It wouldn't budge. I rattled the door handle, but it wouldn't turn. And it didn't even have a keyhole, so it couldn't be locked. I hauled on the handle, rattling the door in the jam, but it stayed frustratingly closed. I hammered on the door, yelling for Rich. Maybe he could push it open from his side. Nothing. I yelled again, this time adding a colourful swear word for good measure. No reply. The door didn't spring open as I expected. Rich didn't stand in the doorway, his face a mask of both amusement and annoyance at the same time. I shouted again but only silence replied. A cold feeling coiled up in my stomach and sat there, heavy and hard to ignore. Something tapped on the window. I turned around, thinking the wind might have just disturbed one of the tree branches against the glass. But no, it wasn't a tree branch tapping on the window, but a long, thin hand. A hand right where there should not have been a hand, at the window of an upstairs bedroom. Its yellow nails squealed against the glass and its skin was grey and mottled so it looked like granite. I was so fixated on the hand that it took me a few minutes to realise that the window was still open. The window was still open. I tried to cross the, win the room to close the window, but my feet wouldn't move. I looked down at them as if staring at them would make them shift towards the window, but they still wouldn't obey. It was like I was completely rooted to the spot. The hand crawled higher up the window and the other hand poked into the room. The fingers wrapped around the window frame, its knuckles white with exertion as the other hand kept tapping. I still couldn't move and the space between me and the window felt like the width of a football pitch. That cold heavy weight in my stomach started to thrash around and the desire to throw up gripped me. Those awful nails finally stopped tapping on the glass but only so the hand could join its fellow in crawling into the room. The hands braced themselves and a sound like a sack being dragged along a concrete path filled the room. Was it hauling itself up the side of the building? A head appeared, bald, swollen and horribly round. It had no nose and its mouth cut across its face in an ugly slash, like it had been drawn by a spectacularly angry child. Yellow eyes swivelled in their sockets, unable to focus on anything, and the thing sniffed the air with two nostrils, punched directly into its grey mottled face. It caught the scent of my aftershave and its head snapped round on its neck, staring at me even though it couldn't see me. I still couldn't move towards the window, so I twisted around and started hammering on the door again. I pounded the wood, screaming for Rich. I was screaming for anyone by that point, really. I didn't care who opened the door. It could have been my vindictive ex-wife at that point. I just would have been glad for the door to open. The thing landed on the carpet with a thump. 
and I howled, not even foreman words anymore. I glanced over my shoulder. It lay on the floor under the window, struggling to right itself, waving its spindly limbs around in the air. It might have been funny, were it not for those long talons and the murderous look on its hideous face. The door handle rattled and my feet sprang to life, forcing me backwards just as the door burst open. Rich stood framed against the mid-afternoon sunshine. He opened his mouth to insult me, but the words died as he took one look at my face. He peered into the room and his eyebrows shot up like a kid's cartoon character. I pushed him away from the door before he could speak, slamming the door shut, sprinting down the stairs, dragging Rich with me. We only stopped running when we reached the front gate. Jason, Mick and Dave leaned against the front wall in the street, bottles of coke in one hand and half-smoked cigarettes in the other. Rich stood at the gate, staring back down the path to the front door. What the hell was that thing? he asked. That, my friend, is why I'm never setting foot in that house again, I said. What's the matter with you two? asked Jason. Mate, we just saw the reason why no one ever stays here long, said Rich. He shook his head and finally looked away from the front door. I caught his gaze and he gave a tiny nod. And you're honestly never going back in there, asked Dave. Nope, and I suggest you three don't either, I replied. I patted myself down. The car keys made a reassuring lump in my jeans pocket and my phone was a thin slab in my back pocket. I had literally no reason to ever set foot in that house again. And to be honest, even if I'd left my phone behind, I would have just got a new one. You're not bothered about the bonus then, asked Jason. He took a drag on a cigarette. The expression of disbelief was etched into his face. It was clear that even if we told him what we'd seen, he'd never accept it. Nah, I'm never setting foot in that house again, I said. I set off to our parking space outside number 39, and to his credit, Rich came with me, and we drove away from the house in his battered old white van. Neither of us ever went back to the Greystone house again, and it was also the last time that we ever saw Jason alive. And that's the end of the first one. I'm just having a quick look at the comments. <laughs> yeah, open windows, just no. Um, not having that. Yeah, that was my attempt at like an MR James style narrative. Um, and the second one I'm going to do for you is um, the one that was kind of has a bit of like pand <laughs> pandemic, uh, like chic in it, I guess. And this one's just simply called The Fair. He glances back inside. His cat, a tortoiseshell queen named Bowie, meows at him. Yeah, yeah, I know you'll want to be kept in the manner you're accustomed to, he mutters. Honestly, the cat is more demanding than the ex-missus. Jake closes the front door behind him and hurries down the path to the driveway. He unlocks the dark red Ford Focus and climbs in. A spare face mask lies on the passenger seat, ready for him to snap on the moment a customer needs a lift. He's not entirely sure that he needs one, not with the huge plastic screen separating him from the back seat. Still, Vadim suggested he wear one. Cannot be too careful, he'd said. Jake checks the app. Looks like there are a few jobs going, but they're all snaffled up by the drivers closest to the town centre. Best get down there and see if there's any work left. He leaves the radio off while he drives, tired of the rolling news that says the same thing every day, tired of the pandemic, tired of not knowing when he'll get enough work again. And if truth be told, he misses the students. They used to take an Uber to go the 300 yards from their accommodation to the university building. But they're all away now, watching lectures online and writing essays from home. The rain falls in diagonal sheets now, and he almost misses her standing by the side of the road near the underpass. His brain makes sense of the outstretched thumb and black hair plastered to her head just before he drives by. Jake pulls over, indicate a clicking as she limps towards the car. He's not supposed to pick up randoms, but to hell with it. The girl will be drenched if she waits out there much longer, and it's not like he's on his way to pick up a job. He puts his mask on before the back door of the Focus opens and she clambers inside. She's wearing a pink raincoat and carrying a sodden off-white tote bag. Jake waits until she's settled, the telltale click of the seatbelt letting him know he can pull away from the curb. You are right, pet? Not the best weather to be outside, he says. He glances at her in the rearview mirror, her face slightly distorted by the plastic screen. Big dark eyes stare back at him and she shakes her head. She has a scarf pulled up over her mouth and nose, but the fabric's no doubt sodden by now. It's horrible, she replies, her words muffled by the scarf. She's got a strange voice, oddly flat and without any real trace of an accent. So, where are we off to? he asks. She gives him an address on the outskirts of the town. Nice neighbourhood, mostly families. 
She falls silent, staring out of the window as the car picks its way through the rainwashed streets. Jake's app pings a couple of times, but he passes over the jobs. It's a funny place, that underpass, says Jake. He hates it when the customers are quiet. It makes him feel like a servant. Why? she asks. You've not heard the stories? She shrugs. Well, all us drivers have heard the stories about that underpass. I mean, I suppose that's not strictly true. It's not the underpass itself. But that's where the Phantom Hitchhiker's meant to hang out. The what now? Yeah, this town has its own phantom hitchhiker. You used to hear stories about things like that a lot more back in the 90s. I suppose people are too wrapped up in their phones now. But yeah, a few of my mates here, they picked someone up there. And by the time they got to where the hitchhiker wanted to go, the back seat was empty. Are all of your friends taxi drivers, she asks. No, none of the ones who tell that story are. The taxi drivers know better. He taps his nose through the mask and lets out a laugh. Jake isn't sure why he detects a note of nervousness in his own guffaw. Phantom hitchhikers must be having a hard time of it at the moment, says the girl. Her eyes crinkle at the corners. Jake nods. It's not something he's thought about, but she does have a point. God alone knows who they're flagging down with fewer car drivers on the road thanks to lockdown. What brought, brought, what brought you out in this weather then, he asks. He turns right onto the top of her street. Picking up my dad's medicine, she replies. Jake catches her glance at him in the rearview mirror. He senses that isn't the truth, but it's not his place to police the pandemic. At least she's covering her face. He pulls up outside the door number she's given him. We're here. He glances in the rearview mirror. The back seat's already empty. He twists in his seat, his gut telling him what his eyes will soon discover. She's gone. Yet both of the back doors of the Focus remain closed. Jake unleashes a volley of swear words under his breath to distract himself from the cold knot of fear in his stomach. He looks up the driveway at the house. He doesn't know why he expected to see a gone figure in a pink raincoat running up the path, not when the garden's completely empty. On impulse, he climbs out of the car, slamming the driver door behind him. He pulls his hood up and hesitates at the bottom of the path. Still, if he hasn't just given a phantom hitchhike a home, a lift home, he's been stiffed for a £20 fare. Jake walks up the path and knocks on the front door. An older woman opens the door. She steps back, keeping her distance, and Jake shuffles backwards. He's just under the shelter of the porch. Can I help you? She asks. I don't know. Um, this is going to sound mad, but I'm an Uber driver, and you've seen her, haven't you? The smile fades from the woman's face. Over her shoulder, Jake spots a framed photograph on the wall. A girl with long black hair and a pink raincoat beams back at him. He gulps and nods. Oh my, it's certainly been a while. A while indeed. The woman holds his gaze. Jake doesn't reply, unsure what to say. Does he need to say anything? How much does she owe you? She asks. What? Oh no, forget it. I had no idea. I'm so sorry to bother you. Don't be silly. She got you to come here and I guess you gave up other jobs to do it. Most drivers just leave a stand in there. But you didn't. Thank you. The woman fishes a purse out of the handbag hanging in the hallway. She snaps it open and pulls out a crisp £20 note. Is this enough? Yeah, but it doesn't feel right. She holds it out, her facial expression telling Jake that she won't brook any argument. He thinks of Bowie in the cupboard that should be full of cat food. He takes a note and slips it into his pocket. Thank you for bringing her home, says the woman. She smiles, nods once and closes the door. Jake runs back to his car, his mask now damp from the rain. He climbs in and closes the driver door. What on earth just happened? His phone pings. A job has come up two streets away. He glances at the empty back seat, shakes his head and accepts the job. At least this passenger has an account to charge. Jake looks up at the house as he pulls away from the curb. He's not sure, but he could swear a figure in a pink raincoat stands at the front door. She gives him a wave before she disappears among the drizzle. The end. But I'll, I'll hand over to our, our darkness shrouded guest now. Who's uh, been sat there in, I don't, have you got a candle on or a little torch or something? A uh, candle. Oh, oh, classic. So, uh, yeah, oh. it says, says a key code. Uh oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. It, it says on the, it says a key on the screen, but this is Lydia. Um, who illustrated our poster for the event with the rotting veg and the creepy moth crawling on the pumpkin and the 
um, the corn and the onions and things. Um, I was wondering, did you, is, was that a physical thing or did you do it digitally? Um, I did with, um, uh, I did it with paint, so physically, and then scanned it in and finished it off. Oh, wow. wow yeah. That was really, um, but yeah, um, go and check that out, everybody, um, afterwards. It's, it's really cool, and it just captured the, the feeling of what we were doing, especially Andrew with his rotting pears. And... Thank you. I'm glad it worked out, yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> um, so you, you, you had something published pandemic-related as well, didn't you? Uh, um, poem. Yeah yeah it was sort of um it was like a call to do it it wasn't like a pay thing but um um the sort of anthology was called together and apart uh for quite apparent reasons um given the you know the nature of pandemic stuff um and there's a bunch of people that contributed work to so it it was quite loose, um, but I did a sort of um, creative, um, non, um, yeah, creative nonfiction type thing. Yeah, it was like a, it was like a poem about what you saw when you were out on your um, hourly mandated yes. walk. Yes. <laughs> cool, yes. I remember. Th you must not go out for more than an hour. I know. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah that, that's, you can't really say that to people <laughs> so much. No. no. Um, yeah, um, did that. That's probably my most official thing. Of, um, the reason why I started all this um, writing thing really is because I um, did, <laughs> if, if anyone and everyone's heard of Adam Z. Robinson, because I know you joined in with his stuff. Um, yeah sort of from when he started doing that um he started sort of like a general writing and a ghost story writing workshop um fantastic um stuff that came out of that and i got more confident with my writing and you know like actually sharing it sometimes um and yeah it's been great fun so um yeah um i'd, I'd like to do well, I, I'm planning to do children's books, have ideas, and then they go on the back burner and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm into a few different stuff, different things. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, look forward to what you got for us. Now, are you going to be able to see it? Okay, with your candle blown out. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stay on Zoom, but I've I've got it typed up, so it's gonna be staring at the screen. Okay. So, yeah. Um, cool. Hand over to you then. Thank you. Okay, um, this story is called Retiring Rabbits. Some of you might be a bit shaken up by the end of this, if your constitution for imagining such things is weak. Anyway, I'll start. I can't remember a time when mum wasn't quiet. She did talk in soft tones that remind me of Turner's later works, all wishy-washy. He was losing his sight towards the beginning of his new life on a plane can't know anything of yet. I'm thinking of one painting in particular, Rain, Steam and Speed, The Great Western Railway, 1844, oil on canvas, dimensions 91 centimetres times 121.8 centimetres, or 36 times 48 inches by Joseph Mallard William Turner. It lives in the National Gallery in London. Melted by the steam from the train and perhaps fog on account of the locomotive's high altitude is a rabbit somewhere on the tracks. I'll, I'll give you a tenner if you can locate the creature. It's soon gone. My mum is the rabbit, I fear. She tells me lots of stories. The one she told me this morning has been on repeat since last Tuesday. It gives me a migraine. I listen every time because it's mum's story mostly. Invidious is an ancient being. It takes that which is not theirs and it has an emotion deficiency. Mum's words, not mine. Invidious scours the universe searching for something to feel whole. Mum reckons in the 1970s is when it visited her. It began latching onto those with the fullest of lives. This way it could feed and then rest thinking it would be sustained for a decent amount of time. 
as soon as invidious realized how fluid people's emotions are that that aspect of their ex uh, of their of our existence was causing its nutrition to embody a cruel half-life invidious ramped up its once in june on the hottest day since records began they say invidious visited mum's home she woke disturbed unusual for her she found my grandparents sullen and ashen unusual for them they were gone by winter of the same year the bodies remained one in the modest living room and one in the modest study their limbs stiff let stiff left at strange angles no one and nothing wishes to carry around spent baggage mum fed and washed and clothed and provided for them until she, until she was old enough to pursue her own life she visited them at home until a different kind of home was deemed more appropriate for their care and there they found peace kids sling around rumors even today that mum's house is haunted they're dead right the house never changed hands, not once. It sits like a scab on the landscape. Many times it has been threatened with demolition. My mum inherited it, and despite all the bad that's happened there, uh, she will not give it up. I visited, I visited the exoskeleton of mum's old place with her just once. We wish we hadn't gone. We saw an apparition of Grandad, for my part, only recognised from photos and drawings from happier times. He was half off his seat on the sofa, one arm stretched forward, palm up, the other stretched painfully backwards and a little up. His face was full of pain. Grandma looked as though she was trying to write and paint and drink coffee and review mum's homework. Mum said granddad usually did that with her. Grandma used to maintain an impeccable visage. She had given up her ritual of doing her hair with curlers. Her limbs were similar to granddad's. Me and mum shuddered in unison, thinking we couldn't surely be seeing what we were seeing. Grandma's head turned sharply towards us. We could feel that Grandad was doing the same. We left. After Mum told me her part of the story again, I began researching how to ward off evil spirits. My partner hates that I sage and salt our house, being sure to get all to get all the nooks and crannies. But he has a brilliant sense of humour. He says we could start a sage salt and ridiculous business right here in our terraced house. It's important to keep your overheads low. I do get obsessed. Rabbit holes are like sweet shops for me. I can't have just one. Mum feels the same way. Once she found me in the dark bathroom, I had cut off my long hair and left it in an odd fashion reminiscent of an offering. When she steered me back to bed, I was trying to crawl out of my own skin. She thinks that this is when Invidious visited me. I know that this was about the time she truly became silent, invisible like the rabbit preferring to hold her feelings close to her heart. But I am strong. I am more knowledgeable of the evils that visit our shores. I won't give up saging, salting, fighting. I'll board up the house and if, <laughs> and if Invidious is already inside, I'll eat it alive. I guess I'm gonna hand over to myself. Um, I don't, has anybody got any questions that they want to ask me before I, I start? I'll just plug my book again tales from badges crossing which i know you've got a copy already haven't you lydia i have yes yeah i uh, recommended yeah check it out andrew's got it my cousin stuart's got one mom and dad um but yeah i'm going to be giving a, a copy away free tonight um after i've done this i've got everybody's name in a hat now look there they are <laughs> a few people have messaged me to say they've already got it and they don't want another copy that's the why <laughs> <laughs> You'll get assigned one, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's fine. Um, anyway, yeah, so, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you about Tales from Badgers Crossing then, everybody. Um, so, about 15 years ago, I went to a talk by G.P. Taylor. Um, he was a Northeast writer. He used to be a policeman and a vicar. And I went to a talk about writing fantasy fiction for children. And I came out of there going, yeah. I can write a novel. <laughs> yeah, 15 years later, um, I hadn't written a novel, but I had collect written a whole bunch of short stories, which I collected together. And then um, a few months after that thing with GP Taylor, I was driving down the road um, in Corby in Northamptonshire, where my parents still live. And I saw a sign on the road out of town that said Badger's Crossing. And my brain just went, wouldn't that be a really cool name for a town where all your ghost stories are set? 
And that was when it really started to fall together. So now there's mythology there. There's reason why it's really haunted. Um, characters keep cropping up. So if you read this, um, certain characters appear in more than one story, although all the stories stand alone and work perfectly well on their own. It's kind of starting to build a bit of a, do a bit of world building. Um, so my story tonight um, is a bit of world building from Badger's Crossing, but it stands alone. Oh, Lydia's turned the light on now. Candle's completely gone. <laughs> um, yeah, my story tonight is a bit of world building from Badger's Crossing. I decided that they'd have their own history uh, and mythology. Uh, and I, when I was trying to think of a folk horror harvest related theme for tonight, I kept coming back to Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, and the idea that Jack was taking the produce to market. And I thought, okay, so I could start with them taking the harvest produce to market. And then I came up with a kind of a fairy story based on somebody taking the harvest to market. Um, and I weaved it in and out of some of the characters that exist in Badger's Crossing already, but don't worry, they're, uh, this stands alone on its own as well. You don't need to have read it, although it would be nice if it did. <laughs> so I wrote, um, wrote a fairy story and I decided what I'm gonna to read tonight is the version that parents don't read to their kids, the version that they edit and make it child friendly. This is not the child friendly version. Uh, and if you don't like dogs in peril, you might want to not listen for a bit, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, uh, sorry, I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just turn your camera off there, Lydia. Might turn my own off as well. That's, uh, no, okay, thank you. So this is a Badger's Crossing fairy tale called Eleanor Culpepper and the Crossroads Book. Once upon a time, there was a farmer's daughter called Eleanor Culpepper. All Eleanor wanted was to be like her father, Henry, and to prove herself to him she worked as hard as any of the seasonal farmhands. She was there before anybody in the morning and always the last to leave each night. And she knew each and every animal by name. As much as he appreciated her help, Henry worried for Eleanor's future. He didn't like to think of her throwing her life away on an endeavor quite as unreliable as farming. He feared she'd get caught up in the same struggles he and his dear departed wife, Catherine, had encountered over the years. So, as he'd promised Catherine before she succumbed to the strain of Eleanor's difficult birth, he vowed to educate their daughter, to teach her to read and write, to understand numbers and science, literature and nature, so that one day, when she was ready, she might leave the hard life of a farmer and make something of herself in the town. But Eleanor did not leave. She worked the farm by day and would spend her nights reading book after book or up to her elbows in parts and grease, fixing and even inventing machinery to increase and improve the farm's output. Do you never think of leaving all this, Ellie? He said to her one night. She looked up at him from her papers and laughed. Oh, father, you are silly. What good is all this knowledge if I can't use it to help those I care about the most? She nodded towards Henry and his sheepdog, Bess, who slept before the fire. I just worry for you, he said, that's all. How will you find a husband when you spend every hour either on the farm or buried in a book? Father, really, she said, I've barely enough time to milk the cows and gather the eggs. When would I find time to go courting? I'm perfectly happy right where I am. She kissed him on the head as she passed on her way to, the, to bed, book clasped firmly under her arm. It's a big day tomorrow with the harvest. I'll need all the sleep I can get. I'll see you bright and early. Yes, said Henry as the seed of a plan began to germinate in his mind. I'll see you when the cock crows. The harvest was good and bountiful, with plenty of grain, milk, fruit and vegetables to treat the farmhands to a huge feast to thank them for their hard work afterwards. As they ate, Henry turned to Eleanor. Well, my dear, we've had another good year and it's largely down to you. Oh, father, but Henry raised a hand. Never mind, oh father this, no father that. I have something important to ask you. Eleanor nodded at him to continue. 
as you've made up your mind to stay and help me, I would like to give you more responsibility on the farm. So tomorrow morning, I'd like you to take the best of the harvest to the dock market on the River Swain in town. And I'd like you to negotiate prices with the traders as they come and go on their boats, taking them to and from Gilworth and beyond. But father, that's always been your job. Aye, it has. But if you really do want to be a farmer, then you need to learn these things. Eleanor threw her arms around him and kissed him on the head. Oh, I promise I won't let you down. Henry smiled. He knew that she would do a good job. She always did with everything. He also knew that the market on the river would be bustling with all kinds of young, attractive and educated people from all over the county. And although it might break it, in his heart, he hoped Eleanor would meet her future husband there and finally be persuaded to leave this difficult life. The next morning, after the farmhands had loaded up the cart with all the year's best produce, Ella, Eleanor harnessed, harnessed her horse Richard to the carriage and made her way into town with Bess sitting beside her. She waved hello to the people as she passed on the road and they waved back with a smile. As the village buildings thinned out and the carts entered the open countryside, her smile dropped a little as she remembered the conversation with her father two nights back. Oh, Bess, she said, what will I do? Father needs my help far more than I need a husband. I wish there was a way to, before she could finish her sentence, Richard reared up on his hind legs with a shriek and Bess began to snarl, her teeth bared and her hackles raised even higher than the time an adder had found its way into the barn. Whoa there, a man wearing a black suit, like those worn by the fancy gentleman from London that Eleanor had read about in the newspaper, stood in the road. He patted the horse's neck, calming the beast. Oh, sir, I do beg your pardon. I got so lost in my own troubles that I didn't see you there in the road. Richard snorted at the man nervously. Bess's teeth remained bared. Eleanor stepped down from the, ca the carriage, giving Bess a good ticking off. And uh, as she did so, stop that right now, do you hear? She said in, in the sheepdog's ear. Oh, it's quite all right, said the man, who dusted himself down and straightened up, straightened up to greet her, smiling as he approached. Eleanor paused, as though caught in his deep, dark, almost black eyes. Despite her wariness of strangers, especially men, she found herself smiling back. The roads around here are busy, he said. I really should watch where I'm going, especially at a crossroads. My dear, he said, holding out a hand. What bothered you so that you took your eyes from the road? Eleanor's cheeks flushed a deep pink as she shook his hand. I, well, I, let me guess, said the man. You're on the way to market and you're desperate to impress someone. He rubbed his chin. Your father? Yes, how did you know? Oh, I just have a, a nose for these things. He tapped the side of his nose three times and chuckled. So why so sad? The old man entrusted you with an important job. This is a big day. Well, yes, sir, but it's just that he's making decisions for me when I know my own mind. I can see that you do. I feel like he's writing my own story for me. The man's dark eyes lit up with excitement. Oh, you like stories. I'll tell you what. He picked up a black rectangular box from his side, set it down on the carriage seat, clicked two latches open on the front and lifted the lid. He rummaged around inside and pulled out a book. It's not much, but please accept this. It might cheer you up. What is it? She said. Oh, just something that might help one. He thought about how to end the sentence for a while. Escape? Yes, escape. It really is quite, quite magical. Oh, I couldn't possibly, sir, not after almost running you down. At least let me trade you for it. Something from the cart, perhaps. The man grinned the widest grin that Eleanor had ever seen. That won't be necessary, he said. There's only one thing I want from you. And what would that be? Your name. Eleanor blushed. Oh, do, do pardon my manners, sir. My name is... Ah, 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 he wagged his finger and then pulled a sheet of paper from the case along with a dip pen and inkwell. Why don't you write it down for me? He pointed to the paper. Just here, 
at the bottom of the page. So I don't forget it later, you see. Eleanor took the paper and looked at it. What at first seemed to be thin black lines, when she studied them more closely, turned out to be rows of prints so tiny she could hardly make out what they said. She squinted and pulled the paper close to her face. The man snatched it away, saying, Oh, don't you worry about that old claptrap. This is just the first spare slip of paper I found at the bottom of my case. Are you sure? Because it looked important. Perfectly, it's just a spare scrap from an old business dealing of mine, now sadly forfeited. He held the pen out to her. Unless... His smile drooped to a frown. Oh, how very insensitive of me forgive me you can't write that's it isn't it i just assumed that a lady of your apparent wit would be able eleanor clenched her fists and gritted her teeth i'm perfectly capable of writing anything i like sir of course you are do forgive me the man placed the paper down on the cart beneath uh, cart bench bess nipped at his fingers but he pulled his hand back just in time bess stop that this instant eleanor said the dog slunk back, head bowed, knowing she was in trouble, but not quite sure what for. The man handed her the pen and she took it from him. She turned it over in her hands and gazed at it in wonder. It was entirely coated in gold. Spiralling all the way around it was an intricately engraved snake with two emerald eyes the size of tiny pinheads. It was the most exotic thing she had ever seen outside of a book. The man twisted the lid from the inkwell and held it out to her. Eleanor dipped the pen, shook the excess ink back into the pot, and began scratching her name on the paper, imagining herself carving it with a pocket knife into the forehead of every man who'd ever patronised or underestimated her. There! She held the paper out to the man defiantly. He took the paper and smiled as he studied it. Eleanor! Eleanor Culpepper! He turned the name over on his tongue. How lovely! You have a very elegant hand, Eleanor, and your writing isn't bad either, he laughed, as he pulled a watch from his pocket and flipped the lid open. Well, I mustn't keep you from your very important day. I hope you make a killing, if you'll excuse the expression, at the market, and impress your dear old dad. He flipped the watch shut again and dropped it into his pocket. He folded the paper and slipped it into his inner jacket pocket, then snapped the case shut and placed it at his side. He held his hand up to help Eleanor step up into the cart. And this, he placed the book on the bench beside her and patted it, making sure to stay well clear of Bess's bite. Belongs to you now. Sir, I fear that I misjudged you. Forgive my effrontery. May I offer you a ride into town, she said, shifting her weight in the seat until she was comfortable. Oh, no, 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 he said, dismissing the idea with his hand as if he was swatting away an annoying fly from his face. It's very kind of you, but I've been waiting a long time. And I've got a feeling that my ride out of here will be along very soon. Well, if you're sure, sir, then I'll be on my way. She gently flicked at the reins and with a blast of his wide nostrils, Richard slowly set off. Good day to you. Perhaps we'll meet again, she said. Oh, we will, he whispered. We will. In fact, I'm sure I'll be seeing you real soon. Oh, sir, wait, you didn't tell me your... Eleanor turned round to catch the gentleman's eye, but he was gone. There was nothing but dusty cobbles and the sign telling her it was four miles to Badger's Crossing. Well, how was it? said Henry when Eleanor came through the door that night. It was wonderful, Father. I met so many people and they were all lovely and... She took a bag out from her shoulder and... a bag off of her shoulder and emptied a mountain of banknotes and contracts onto the table. We sold everything, not a single grain of wheat left. Well, that's wonderful, said Henry, but enough business talk. Tell me about these people you met. Was there anyone special? Special, unusual, different. Anyone you found yourself drawn to? Well, there was one man. Henry rubbed his hands. A man, tell me more. How did you meet? I met him on the roads. I almost ran him over with Richard. Henry closed his eyes and gently shook his head. Oh, he was all right. I, I didn't actually get him. Well, that's a good start. Was he handsome? Eleanor scratched her chin, unable to bring the image of his face into her mind's eye and unsure whether he'd 
actually been handsome at all, or if it was his charisma that she found alluring. I suppose he was, yes, she said. He was most definitely an intriguing gentleman, I'll say that. Henry clapped his hands together. Wonderful! And his name? Oh, it never occurred to me to ask. You never... But he took my name. I wrote it down for him. There can't be too many Eleanor Culpeppers around here, can there? And what was he like? Eleanor thought on this for a moment and settled on well-read. Sounds like a perfect match. I'm proud of you, you know, he said. Come, have a drink with me while we celebrate today's successes. Eleanor yawned. If it's all the same, Father, it's been a long day and I'm rather tired and I think I'd just like to go to bed with a book. She kissed his forehead. Good night, Father. Good night, Ellie, said Henry. Sleep well. Once Eleanor had washed and dressed the bed, she lit her lamp on her nightstand, took the book from her bag and settled down to read. It was not at all what she expected, and certainly not as special or as magical as the man seemed to believe it was. After scanning over the contents page, she was disappointed to see that it was just a collection of old children's stories, many of which she already knew and had grown out of years ago. Nevertheless, she thought it discourteous not to at least try it. Once upon a time, there was a naughty little boy and his name was Andrew Marlius. Huh, that's a curious name, she whispered before reading on in silence. After a few minutes, she put the book down. Well, at least you'll look good on the bookshelf, she said with a yawn and snuffed the wick of her lamp. The cockerel woke her the next morning and once she dressed, she came down to the kitchen to make breakfast for herself and her father. However, the kettle was already filled and sitting on the stove still warm. Beyond the kettle, out of the kitchen window, she saw her father in the far field, running back and forward, chasing cows here and there. Although she knew he would be annoyed, she couldn't help but laugh. The sight of him being evaded every time he got near one of the beasts was so comical. Eventually, she put on her boots and ran into the field to help him round up the animals. What happened, she said, as they herded the last of the cows back into the barn. I woke up early. I couldn't get back to sleep, so I came down this morning to make a pot of tea. And as I waited for the kettle to boil, I opened the shutters and there were cows everywhere in the meadow, the crops. One even got in the yard and ate my roses. Eleanor stifled a laugh. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I know you're proud of them. So a broken lock then? Need me to fix it? That's the strange thing. The lock is perfectly intact. And I know I closed it last night because I asked Jack to go back and check. Must have been some little rapscallion from the village up to no good. If I ever get my hands on them, I'll... You'll ruffle their hair, give them a penny for aniseed balls and send them on their way. You're a big softy. Henry nodded. You've got the measure of me, he said. I do, and I hope you never change. He took her by the hand and led her back to the house. Now, what about that tea? It must have gone cold by now. How about making your old man a fresh one? That night, she stared at the book on the shelf as she prepared for bed. Perhaps I was too harsh, she whispered. I was tired after all. I should give you another try. She plucked it from the shelf and settled down to, in bed to read. Once upon a time, there was a cunning little fox and his name was Andrew Marlius. She stared at the page. A fox? But yesterday it was a boy, I swear it was, she said. I must have been more tired than I realised, she said with a chuckle and read on before falling asleep and being woken a few minutes later by the book falling on her face. She placed it on her nightstand and snuffed out the lamp. Ellie, Ellie, wake up! Her father hammered on the door. Eleanor groaned. It was still dark. What was going on? It's the hens, quick! She leapt out of bed and threw on some boots under her nightgown, not bothering to put on any other clothing, and ran downstairs to the hen house, grabbing a lamp on the way. As she ducked down and clambered into the hen house, the lamplight revealed the mutilated corpses of chickens and crimson stained feathers littering the hay strewn floor. Blood dripped down the walls in congealing clumps and pooled into sticky, deep wine red puddles. And then a gasp as her father knelt in the mess and cradled the limp, headless body of his favourite chicken, Molly, in his arms, unconcerned by the ichor soaking into his nightclothes. 
A fox, he spat. After all our hard work, this is how the Lord repays me? With a bloody fox to take my hens? Eleanor laid a hand on his shoulder. He rested his cheek on it. What are we going to do, Ellie? What are we going to do? Let's get some sleep. There's nothing more we can do tonight. But in the morning, let's get, gather the hand. We're going to hunt it and catch it. And when we do, I'm going to kill it. As if it understood what had happened to its kin, the cock didn't crow as dawn broke, but Eleanor awoke all the same. When the hands were gathered, everyone was tasked with finding and killing the fox. The cows went unmilked, the pigs unfed, the water troughs unfilled, but a day's searching revealed no trace of the creature, no tracks, no scats, no new burrows in the hedgerow, no more kills. Exhausted and exasperated, Eleanor and her father returned to the farmhouse, too tired to do anything, but fall straight into bed. Tomorrow, father, she said as she kissed him goodnight on the top of his head. It's a small consolation and it won't bring the chickens back, but it's only a fox. What more harm can it do now? Henry just grunted nodded and shuffled to his bedroom. The light through the slit under his door went out before Eleanor had even crossed the hallway to her own room. She'd intended to go straight to sleep herself, but her mind was still racing with thoughts and ideas and possibilities. So she dropped the book onto her bed, ready to pick up where she'd left off the night before, once she dressed for bed. But it plopped open on the first page of the first story. She picked it up to flick to the bookmarked page, but before she could, the first line of the story caught her eye. Once upon a time, there was an unspeakable creature, half man, half beast, and his name was Andromalius. The book dropped from her hands and skittered along the floor until it disappeared under the bed. Let the damned thing stay there, she said, climbing into bed. I wish I'd never set eyes on it. The next day, Eleanor was awoken by a loud bang and an ear-piercing ear yelp. She rushed downstairs without dressing fearing something terrible, yet the sight before her was worse than anything she could have imagined. Henry stood over the prone, bloodied body of Bess, rifle still pointed at the poor creature. Father, she cried, what have you done? Henry said nothing, but let the gun, the gun clatter to the floor. He sat at the kitchen table and wept into his open hands. Oh, my dear sweet Bess, Eleanor whispered. Descending to her knees, tears filled her eyes as she ran her hands through the blood-matted fur. She held Bess in her arms, stroking her head, whispering, It's all right, Bess, I'm here, over and over, until she could no longer feel the dog's shallow breaths on her neck. Once the initial shock had passed, Eleanor turned to Henry, her eyes filled with confusion and rage. Why, father? Why have you done this? Still overcome with emotion and unable, unable to speak, he just pointed over his shoulder. She tentatively followed his fingers to the unshuttered window, afraid to look at what lay beyond. But look, she did. If the hen house had been an ungodly atrocity, then what greeted her eyes as she peered through the glass was an infernal vision from the very depths of hell itself. The meadow beyond the yard where the sheep usually grazed was a carpet of blood, entrails and ragged pelts of crimson stained fleece. Dead staring eyes protruding from skinless faces gazed lifelessly, pleading too late for Eleanor to do something. And bloodied tongues lolled from wide open jaws, forever frozen in petrified screams. She clasped her hand to her mouth. All of them, she said, no. There are three left. There were five for a few minutes. But I had to put two of them out of their misery. Eleanor spun on her father. As you did with poor Bess, she spat. He bowed his head. I had to. Why? She screamed. Henry pointed to Bess's muzzle. Eleanor leaned in, realising that the blood around her mouth and jowls was darker and drier than that oozing from her recently ruptured flank. You can't think. I wish I did. But the proof is right there. It was her all along. You're wrong. Bess would never, a sob halted the rest of the sentence, and she stormed out of the room, leaving her father weeping at the table. She stamped upstairs, kicked the bedroom door open, and clambered to her hands and knees, reaching wildly under the bed for the book. Eventually, she hooked a fingernail into the cloth cover and dragged it towards her, careful not to flick it open and glance upon the horrors it might summon to trouble them for a fourth night. <clears throat> 
She took the sash from her curtain and bound the book shut with it. After thrusting it into a shoulder bag, she quickly dressed, making sure to put on her riding boots. She stomped down the stairs and on her way to the yard, grabbed her father's rifle at his feet and the pouch of ammunition from the table. What are you going to do? Henry spluttered through his fingers. I'm going to see a man about a dog, father, and then I'm going to put an end to this. Once the horse was bridled and saddled up, she slung the rifle over her back and rode out of the village with as much haste as Richard could muster. When the crossroads came into sight, she tugged on his rein, leaping out of the saddle before he'd even stopped, and led him to a nearby tree. She lashed him to a sturdy branch and patted his nose. Stay here, my friend, she said. I don't want you anywhere near him when he comes. Slowly, carefully, checking the road in all directions as she crept, she approached the centre of the crossroads. When she reached it, she unhooked the rifle from her back and loaded a shell from the pouch into the firing chamber. She pulled out the book, untied the sash from around it and threw it into the centre of the crossroads where it fell open on the first page. Andromalius, she screamed, show yourself. Nothing, except the echo of her voice and the rattle of startled birds fleeing from treetops. Andromalius, I know you can hear me. Come out and face me like a man. She paused and smirked. Or are you too afraid of a mere girl? Still nothing, except a nervous whinny from Richard. Oh, I wish he would. Hello, Ellie. She spun around. There he was, grinning like the cat who'd cornered the mouse. You, she roared, leveling, leveling the rifle at his chest. Nobody calls me that except my father. Is that how you greet an old friend? How about, hey Andy, how's it going? Thanks for the book, dude, I really liked it. Especially the twist ending, you know, that kind of thing. She, he stepped towards her. She raised the rifle to his face. You're upset, aren't you? He held up his hands and took a step back, stumbling on the loose gravel as he did so. He reached for the signpost to steady himself, but he fell to his knees. As he clambered back to his feet, his trouser leg rode part way up his calf, and Eleanor's glance was drawn to the maroon stain surrounding an oval of angry looking puncture marks on his bare leg. Bess, she whispered, lowering the gun. Richard snorted behind her, and she turned her head to check on him. In the split second that her attention was elsewhere, Andromalius crossed the intersection and gripped her by the throat. She gasped for air as she found herself getting lost in his black, black eyes, eyes as dark and boundless as a moonless night. He lifted her up, gripping her tightly beneath her chin until her feet left the floor. She kicked at him, but the blows just glanced away. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to put you down and you're going to be a good, obedient little girl. You're going to pack up your bag, ride good old reliable Richard here, all the way back home and sit down with a nice cup of tea. You English really do love your tea. And a book, my book. And when I come to you tonight, and I will come to you, I'll finally be free. And Ellie, oh dear, clever, feisty, misguided Ellie, you and your precious daddy will be the first to face my wrath. He threw her to the floor and she fell sprawling to the grass at the side of the crossroads. She coughed and wheezed, sucking in mouthfuls of air. She cast him a glance so full of hatred and intent to harm that his smile dropped for the briefest moment and he took a step back. I'll kill you before you cross the yard, she croaked, rubbing her throat. Yeah, good luck with that. He stumbled again, holding a hand out to stop himself from falling. Eleanor looked on aghast as Andromalius seemed to be supporting his weight on nothing but thin air. Oh, I see now, she said, grinning. You're trapped. You can only leave your prison for a short while each night after I open that accursed book, and only in the form of whatever is in the story. Well, I'll never read another word. Andromalius straightened his tie, ran his fingers through his hair, and pulled him up to his full pulled himself up to his full height, towering over her and blocking out the sun as he grinned that horrible, charismatic, smug grin. You stupid girl, it's too late for that. 
You set the wheels of my release in motion as soon as you signed your name over to me. Whenever you read, the, whether you read the book or not, my story will be completed. I'll only get stronger with each breach of the contract. The last three nights were just a taster of what will happen if you fail to finish the story. And believe me, you don't want the story to go unfinished because Bess, he poked out his bottom lip and twisted his fists under his eyes. Poor sweet Bess won't be there to protect you from the next meeting with... I really should come up with a cool sounding name for when I'm in my half man, half fox phase. Shall we call him Volpine? Yes, let's. Anyway, I digress. Bess won't save Daddy and his in his sleep a second time. But you? He looked you up and down. I think I'll keep you as a pet for a good long while. Ow! He grimaced and rubbed at his injured calf. Cursing under his breath, stupid mutt had it coming after what she did to me in my weakened state. Eleanor shook with rage, gritting her teeth and clenching her fists so tight that her nails drew spots of blood from her palms. She climbed to her feet, picked up the rifle and aimed it again at Andrew Marlis's chest. He stepped towards her, but she loosed the shot before he could get any closer. He stopped, reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out the still steaming bullet, along with the paper she'd signed, which now had a perfectly circular hole through the center. Nice shot. He peered at her through the hole, poked his finger through it, and then he sighed. But I really did like this suit. I'm going to make you pay, you troublesome little girl. But first, how about a little spoiler from tonight's story? I think you'll like it. He turned away from her and walked towards the centre of the crossroads, hand outstretched to pick up the book. Once upon a time, there was a devilishly handsome man. And his name was Andrew Marlius, she called as she loaded another bullet into the chamber and levelled the gun at him again. He whipped his head around to her, teeth bared and black eyes brimming with malice. Stubborn, foolish girl, he crowed. Why don't you admit you're beaten? There can still be a happily ever after, of sorts, if you put your primitive weapon down. I only have three things to say to you. One, I haven't been a little girl for a very long time. Two, you are not even half a man. And... Keeping her finger on the trigger, she slowly lowered the gun as he cackled in triumph and turned towards the road, or what was sitting on it, behind him. His smile froze and his eyes flew wide open. Dawning horror slowly replacing the malevolence. What are you doing? I'm finishing the story my way. No, he raced towards her, hand outstretched. She pulled the trigger as he leapt forward, reaching for the bullet, which whooshed between his open fingers before he could close them. As he sailed through the air, he twisted his head towards the book in time to see the lead slug plough through the pages, sending a plume of tattered paper blasting into the air. He turned back to her, his face contorted with surprise and fear. Andromalius crumbled to dust before he hit the floor. The perforated contract gently drifted back and forth on the breeze amongst a confetti shower of shredded paper until it settled on top of the pile of ash where it burst into flames. Three, I prefer science journals, you dull-witted buffoon. I never did like fairy tales. The end. <laughs>